Hello, my name is Annette DeFavory, and I'd like to welcome you to the BC Library Association Summer Conference. This session is part of our 2020 virtual webinar series titled, The Conversation Continues. BCLA is privileged to be presenting the 2020 Summer Conference from the City of Vancouver, which is located on the unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. We're really pleased uh, with the program uh, we had prepared for BCLA's 2020 annual in-person conference. And when we couldn't go ahead with that conference, we asked presenters if they would share virtually some of the fantastic ideas they had prepared for the in-person conference. This was an opportunity for BCLA to work with our community and to help contribute to the professional learning of our community. Thank you to all the presenters in this series who have contributed to the BC uh, Library Summer Conference. Let me give you a couple of notes about today's session. So it is being recorded live with an audience. And because this session is being recorded, it will be available through the BCLA website. And we want to remind you that the questions or comments in the chat window that are sent to all attendees will be captured in that recording. If you have technical questions during the course of this presentation, please send a message through the chat feature to panelists only, and then one of our staff will be able to get back to you and, and hopefully help you with your question. When there are questions for today's presenters, please add your question to the chat and then select for all panelists and presenters. This way everyone can see your question. So let me introduce today's speakers for you. Mei Chan is currently head metadata, metadata services for the University of Toronto Libraries. She was previously cataloging manager for Burnaby Public Library. In 2013, May was part of establishing the Code for Lib BC Regional Chapter representing the interests of public libraries and technical services. She is passionate about seeing people empowered to navigate the future through acquiring computational literacy and appreciation for structured metadata. Jordan Peterson is a recent graduate turned metadata librarian at the University of Toronto Libraries, as well as a joyful volunteer. While at work, she delights in working with technical tools, solving problems pro programma programmatically <laughs> whenever possible and harnessing technology to be creative. While not at work, she loves volunteering with many organizations, including the Carpentries, an accessible tech teaching organization. Rachel Wang is an application programmer analyst at the University of Toronto Libraries as well. She supports the work of the Institutional Repository and Journal Production Services. Rachel is also a certified Carpentries instructor and enjoys helping others learn technical skills. Welcome, May, Jordan, and Rachel. I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce the session title and the, uh, the remainder of the session. Thanks for being with us today. Great. Hi, everybody. And thank you, Annette, for the warm welcome and introductions. And thank you to everybody. I see there's 25 uh, attendees uh, on, on our session here. Thank you all for um, finding some time in your morning uh, to spend some time with us. Uh, so I'm May. And and I'm Jordan. I think you should see um, if you've got speaker view, whatever we speak will pop up. But I'm, May, I'm Jordan, and I'll hand it over to Rachel. Hi everyone, I'm Rachel. All right, so uh, today's presentation is essentially a series of stories uh, related to a pilot project that wrapped up very recently at the end of April. Um, and, and it wrapped up in terms of just the budget being spent out. Um, but what we're still seeing is that it's, uh, it's having an impact, an ongoing impact on the U of T community, which we're really pleased to see. And um, we'll tell you more about that um, throughout the, the presentation. 
And so like May was saying, we'll be taking a pretty narrative approach today. Um, and the stories we'll be telling will highlight some of the core lessons that we've learned as we've undertaken this project. But also we wanted to distill it to a point where we can share with you some of um, the lessons learned that will be very broadly applicable. Um, and so your mileage may vary um, for some of these lessons, depending on the communities you're a part of. Um, but we're hoping to give some pretty solid uh, guidance for any sort of uh, technical project or teaching project or even just like grassroots organization um, that you're taking on at your library. Today's presentation will cover the following topics. Why do we care about computational thinking? What was the vision for scaling up? We'll explain what exactly the Carpentries is, the opportunity at the University of Toronto, the impact of the project, lessons learned and moving forward. And I'd also like to ask if you have any questions, please post in the chat and we'll address during the Q&A session. Thank you. All right, so we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about computational thinking. And uh, I put a reference in the slide. Um, this is um, a really great, uh, pretty accessible article about what computational thinking is. Um, and uh, we thought before we get into the details of our project that it would be really important to provide some context or, or around our own learning journeys um, in developing technical skills and, and developing our own um, computational thinking. So what is it? Uh, why do we care? Um, in a nutshell, uh, so do read the article yourself, but in a nutshell, computational thinking is the ability to discern uh, what humans can do better than computers and what computers can do better than humans. Um, and why do we care? Um, so I, I, we're going to each tell a little bit of, uh, give a little bit of background of how um, we started with um, our own development and how that uh, led us to the, the Carpentries. So um, my undergrad is, an, an, is English literature. So um, I have a humanities background. Um, I also have an interest in linguistics. Um, and I got my uh, library degree back in 2000. And so uh, at some point in my career, about maybe like less than 10 years, um, there was a job posting uh, for a monograph cataloger position at Simon Fraser University. And uh, uh, the job posting required preferred knowledge of Perl scripts. Uh, needless to say, I did not get the job, but it was a bit of a wake up call in terms of the skill sets that was required of um, the like sort of what of, of, of what's required of librarians working with metadata. And so as a result of that, um, I started to take uh, some, some, some various coding workshops. They were self-directed. Um, because of the like, work I did as a cataloger, I needed to learn regular expressions and SQL. Um, at some point, I, just, I, I took a Carpentries uh, a workshop uh, for library staff. And it was a really transformative experience for me. And I became hooked on the community of practice. Um, and then eventually I, I wanted to pay that forward by becoming a certified carpentry instructor. And in 2018, when I moved to Toronto, um, I met um, Jordan and Rachel and, and told them about the carpentries. Uh, so in my own learning journey, I, I just overall saw that working with metadata required more computational and technical literacy. And as part of my learning experience, I encountered a number of barriers to accessing te technical tools and acquiring those skills. Um, these are like personal, social, and institutional barriers. And I'll touch on more of that later after um, Rachel and Jordan introduce themselves. And to pick up the, the bit of the narrative thread, um, like May was saying, we met in 2018, which was my introduction to the Carpentries. Um, but before that, I was also coming out of a undergraduate degree in fine arts and philosophy. And so I had more of a humanities background. And then when I started at the University of Toronto um, iSchool in the fall of 2017, um, I also started as a talent student, which is the Toronto Academic Library's internship, which is sort of um, similar to graduate student um, library assistants, but there's also a component where the library commits to professional development opportunities for you. And I was working in e-resources and metadata at the time, which is where I currently work now as a librarian. Um, but we were talking about creating a roadmap for my professional development. And one thing that I realized I really was lacking was technical skills. 
And so um, when I was talking to May and she mentioned about the carpentries and it being really accessible to novice learners, um, I thought, oh, this is a great chance to get involved. Um, she also mentioned that anyone who had carpentries instructor training would be somebody that she wouldn't hesitate to hire, which as a, as a student is like big light bulb moment. Um, and so I applied to be an instructor and I was fortunate that there was a current grant um, put forth by the California Digital Libraries, I believe, where they were training um, library and library carpentry instructors. And so there was some funding there and I did that in the summer of 2018, which is where I met Rachel. And so since then I've taken the chance to teach, which really, um, I can't um, overstate just how much that's impacted uh, my career as a librarian, albeit a very short one, um, because it has been sort of this thread that's ran through from my student experience into now my professional experience. So take it away, Rachel. Uh, so to continue on this uh, sharing of our journey into carpentries, I, I also have a non-traditional background in technology. I started off in social sciences and humanities, and I'm a French major. I later on picked up the technical skills. So it's, it was really close to my heart to begin with that I could help others learn computational skills. Uh, I started at the University of Toronto Libraries in 2018 on contract as an application programmer analyst in digital preservation, which is a totally different department than May and Jordan. Um, being a new staff member, everybody attends a new hire orientation and that's where I met May. Uh, we had a conversation about my lime green shoes. <laughs> and little did I know that that five minute conversation um, was really a life changer. We started talking about our common interests uh, in teaching and technology. And May told me about the carpentries. Um, I applied for training in 2018, got accepted, packed my bags for Calgary, and that's where I met Jordan for the first time. And that experience was truly amazing. The two day instructor training, after I came back, I was super pumped to figure out how at UT could we bring the carpentries here and how could we foster that community, uh, which is how a year later, the project team has brought together a community of people who are passionate about compute, computational thinking. So I just wanted to highlight um, that the common thread in, in all of our journeys, regardless of where we are in our career, is that we have this interest in, in, in cultivating our, our computational thinking, our literacy and developing skills. And um, as we progressed in our own learning, we became interested in democratizing that. And I, I, I use that word because um, this is coming back to what I touched on in barriers to learning. Um, you know, I, I had to work through a lot of my own psychological barriers. You know, I come from background in humanities. I wasn't as good as math as I would have liked to be. Um, and, you know, having to learn um, to read code or just to understand patterns, you know, that could be intimidating for somebody like myself who didn't have a lot of confidence in, in working through logic and math and, and all that. Um, and that was, that was, that was, that was uh, something I need to really push through. But there are also um, social and institutional barriers. Um, I do think there is a bit of a barrier um, being, um, um, being female and a person of color uh, pressing into the world of library technology. I found myself dealing with gatekeepers a lot. Um, there were barriers to tools, barriers to thinking, which meant barriers to thinking if you don't have access to tools. I often had to make a case repeatedly to get permissions from the IT or systems department. And I became very sensitive to this idea of the haves and have nots. And so I was very interested in this idea that you know, um, as society, as the rest of society takes an interest and expresses the need to, to skill up, develop this new literacy and new ways of thinking, so must people working in libraries, um, like in, in supporting community needs, the profession itself and the people working in it also need to skill up. And so if, um, um, you know, there are these barriers to our, 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 our learning and thinking, we, like, how do we go about re reducing and chipping away at those barriers? So um, yeah, that's kind of like the, the place where we are telling our story and, 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 and talking about our project. And so as our journey continued, um, May and I had applied to teach a, a <clears throat> pardon me, a Carpentries workshop at Code for Lib. And when we got accepted, it was super exciting and Rachel was going to, and 
Um, for me, it was really exciting because it was the first time I had been surrounded by so many technologists and I, I didn't understand a lot of what was going on, but I really appreciated having Rachel there who gave really clear explanations in a way that I think draws on this um, like strong desire to be able to teach to novices. Um, but as we were talking um, throughout this conference, at one point we were having a conversation about wouldn't it be great if we could bring these sorts of things that have benefited each of us so much back to our home community at the University of Toronto. And I was like, well, how do we make that happen? Because there's been a variety of initiatives over the years and it sort of waxes and wanes. Um, and it was like, oh, one of us suggested, well, what about an institutional membership? Because that would give us access to instructor training for lots of people, um, 20 odd people. Uh, and so that was where this idea was born as out of this conversation um, that we had at a conference. And it gave us this, um, I guess, vision of skilling up that we knew we could give back to our local community, but also to the Carpentries community for, for teaching us so much about teaching. So um, it all started with this vision and we'll go over now like how we actually executed that because something that you'll see throughout this presentation is it takes a lot of labor to organize something in a grassroots way. And um, this was only the beginning and I don't think any of us anticipated just how um, both exciting and challenging that that process is. So we've been hearing a lot about the Carpentries, but what exactly is it? Uh, the Carpentries is a nonprofit organization that comprises of software carpentry, data carpentry, and library carpentry communities. Within these communities, it's comprised of instructors, trainers, maintainers, helpers, and supporters. And the whole mission of the Carpentries is to teach foundational, computational, and data science skills to researchers. And the key thing is that their vision is to be the leading inclusive community teaching data and coding skills. And so in the next slide, we'll go over um, what that Carpentries membership that we had talked about actually looks like. And I just want to emphasize before I go further that you can take advantage of any of the Carpentries resources without actually paying anything. It is open access, open source um, development. And so really the benefits from membership come to, um, well, basically there's priority access to instructor training. So as we were mentioning, uh, Rachel and I went to instructor training on a grant when there was a little bit of extra money, but usually the wait time to become an instructor, I think is anywhere between a year and 18 months. So it's a bit of time um, where we were able to skip that with a membership. Um, they also provide, the organization, the Carpentries provides administrative support for up to six workshops in a year. And then also too, it allowed us to really um, to use the expression, put our money where our mouth was, that as an organization or as an institution, we were supporting something that, again, is an open access, open source initiative um, when we're an organization that has the budget for these sorts of things. Um, so to actually talk about the, the, the details of that, I think I'm going to turn it over to May. So um, this is now like in reference to the the, the conversation that we had um, back at the the hotel conference in um, I guess was it uh, February 2019 uh, where uh, Jordan and Rachel were like yeah let's bring instructor training to the University of Toronto and I'm like how do you make that happen um, and then the idea was oh well we might need to get an institutional membership then I was like how much would that cost and then I think we kind of took a guesstimate and, and, and where we would find the money. So the timing of that conversation coincided with the announcement for uh, like call for proposals um, internally at the University of Toronto for the Chief Librarian Innovation Grant. So I wanted to talk a little bit about this. Um, this is only, uh, this is a kind of an initiative only in its third year. It's a one time only funding initiative introduced by the chief librarian, uh, currently Larry Alford, uh, to implement unique projects that have the potential to be uh, transformative for UTL and the communities we serve. 
So um, the grants are intended um, as a challenge to test new ideas while also fostering a culture of um, exploration, innovation, uh, collaboration, and all that good stuff, right? So we're, 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 um, we're encouraged to submit bold and creative projects and I said, I said to Jordan and Rachel, this has got the Carpentries like, name all over it. So we've got to submit a proposal. So uh, our proposal was then to um, position UTL, uh, University of Toronto Libraries, as an innovative hub that coordinates and supports computational literacy and data science skills at U of T um, by piloting a, a Carpentries membership. Um, and it would be at a tier that would allow us to train um, up to 24 instructors. And then out of that, um, out of having that base, um, instructor base developed, we would then organize, um, you know, six-ish workshops um, and then assess the impact to make a case to renew the membership. So that's basically the Chief Librarian and Revocation Grant in, in a nutshell. And uh, I'm going to give it to, over to Jordan to talk about the opportunity and the benefits. So once we had figured out a, a source of funding for where this money could come from, we really wanted to make sure that we weren't leaving people behind because something that I think we've all faced um, in our work life is that by dealing with a really large institution, sometimes um, there's not a lot of opportunity to collaborate between departments. You don't always know all of your coworkers. Um, it can just be really difficult to make bridges outwards. And so what we wanted to do, um, and Rachel will speak a little bit more about this when we talk about um, how we picked instructors to, to be part of the training, was we were looking at how we can bring the most benefit to the most people. So we were looking at ways that we could learn from one another. So are we going to be able to pull in librarians, staff, graduate students? Are we able to pull in people from across all of the University of Toronto campuses? And also when we're focusing on learning from one another, can we balance out each other's strengths and weaknesses? So some people are really comfortable with teaching, but maybe less comfortable with technical tools and vice versa. So this opportunity um, to get a Carpentries membership and to increase um, the presence of the Carpentries in Toronto and Southern Ontario more broadly was really so that people could have access to instructors who knew how to teach technical skills effectively to novice learners, but also that we're willing to make the commitment to skill everybody up, to really be um, leaders and also really learn how to listen and um, learn from community needs. So we saw a very broad opportunity and then we needed to be strategic about how we were choosing participants um, to get this first iteration of the project off the ground. The following diagram just breaks down the University of Toronto community and it's just to give you an idea of the size of community and the opportunity we have for reach and how and what we can tap into. So the University of Toronto is a tri-campus system. We have three campuses. We have a college system. We have seven different colleges with over 700 undergraduate programs, over 300 graduate programs. We have over a thousand uh, organizations and clubs. 42 libraries, 18 central libraries, 14 central systems, and over 14,000 uh, faculty and over 7,000 staff. And lastly, 158 librarians. So you can, you have an idea of just how vast the community we're talking about at UT. So, um, we submitted our proposal and we found out that it was accepted in late April of 2019 um, and fiscal year begins May 1st for, for, for University of Toronto. Um, so that was when the budget was made available, May 1st, 2019. So we immediately applied for an institutional membership that gave us access to um, instructor training for up to 24 people. And the membership cost was the largest budget item. So we were spent out pretty early. Uh, the project team got to work right away with organizing instructor training uh, and um, for, 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 for our purposes, that was the primary membership benefit in terms of building a, a, a core community. Um, so given that there were only 24 seats, uh, part of the work was to organize um, in, um, a, a call or issue a call for our applications. We uh, kept the call open for less than two weeks. Actually, it was around this time last year. Um, and to our amazement, 79 people from across all three campuses uh, applied. Uh, the majority of applications came from graduate students uh, from a wide range of disciplines. 
And uh, the next more noticeable group was library staff. And uh, we were also very delighted to see a, a, a few folks from the research offices uh, indicate interest. So just to uh, break down further of the criteria we were looking for in candidates for instructor training, these are a couple of things that we had in mind. We were looking at diversity inclusion, also in terms of our tri-campus representation, because we are spread across three campuses. Uh, we were looking at the diversity of disciplines uh, and making sure we paid attention to applicants that are coming from humanities and social sciences in particular, because we know the Carpenter's cu curriculum is quite science heavy. And we were looking at sustainability. So 50% of the seats uh, were given to university staff, 50% were given to graduate students. But we also wanted to see commitment. We wanted to see if applicants were indicating that they were committed to finishing their certification process and also being part of the Carpentries community long term. Once training is over, would these participants be willing to share their experiences with other libraries or even the greater community? We also looked at familiarity with the Carpentries. Uh, have attendees already attended a workshop before? Were they a helper? Were they an instructor? And we were also looking at if they had experience teaching technical skills. Uh, the last point we were looking at was participation in library technology communities. We were curious to see if any of the applicants are active in other communities such as Code for Lib, Axis, or Lita. So the instructor training was a ton of fun. Um, and I honestly joined a lot of this process around the time of the instructor training, because at that point, I wasn't sure whether I was going to be um, employed at the University of Toronto or somewhere else because I was graduating. Um, but I was really excited to see that when we actually did in train instructors, 24 um, people would have been 100% of our instructors followed through. Um, but we actually had over 75%. We have 14 people who have definitely completed, seven people are, are in the process of completing their certification. And that process is actually a little bit longer than you would think. So what that includes is you participate in this two-day workshop of where you're learning how to teach technical skills. But then after that, you participate in a community call with Carpentries instructors from across the world. You also add a little contribution to a Carpentries lesson and you teach a little teaching demo that's about five minutes online um, just so that you get a little more comfortable and again show a little bit of uh, commitment to the Carpentries and to teaching just in general. So that was a pretty great measure of success um, but we've also had to do a few other things to keep this community thriving. So one of them was to have some local instructor certification supports. So uh, Rachel taught a couple workshops on how to use Git and GitHub because that's a tool that's often used in the community but is then also broadly used for anybody taking on technical projects because it keeps track of versions. Um, we also created a University of Toronto Carpentries listserv where we could post about new teaching opportunities, congratulate people who had got through their instructor training, ask for anybody who needed support, um, and then we also successfully completed uh, three workshops before COVID-19 shut down a lot of our uh, university activities. We had three more planned for May, um, but unfortunately they have been postponed um, and will now be outside of the, the scope of this grant. Um, but yeah, these were some of the uh, like tangible, uh, quantifiable outcomes. But on a personal level, we've seen a ton of really interesting personal growth, um, and just genuine, uh, I don't know, excitement is not a good enough word. It's, it's just really been great to see the way that people have blossomed into being community participants who are encouraging one another. Um, and we just don't have numbers on that. So we'll talk a little bit more about that, I think, at the end. But these were our tangible or like quantifiable outputs. In addition to the points that Jordan mentioned in terms of outputs and outcomes, we also saw these three things, which was number one, community connections. To support the growth of our community, we knew we had to reach out to other communities. And at the bottom, you'll see just a short sample of organizations that have actively engaged us. And this could be through requesting workshops from us. They have supplied instructors, helpers, or volunteers. 
they've hosted us at their institution or they provided introductions to other organizations. We also hired a graduate student to help us with community engagement. And we also wanted to provide the student with the opportunity to become a, a Carpentries community member. And she actually participated in a workshop. Uh, lastly, our project team also grew from the original five to eight. We knew we wanted to host workshops across the three campuses. So it was required for us to tap into these communities and get the assistance in order to engage tri-campus. But overall, we've seen a lot of benefits, including cross participation from the Carpentries community to other communities, such as Code for Lib. Some of our instructors have gone on to uh, teach at those conferences or events, uh, as well as professional development events and other institutions. So um, as Rachel just mentioned, our uh, one outcome that emerged after instructor training was the expansion of the project team. Of uh, actually, it was 10. I thought it was eight as well. But this morning when I was combing over the slides, I realized that it was actually 10. Um, so um, um, I, I wanted, we wanted to um, front this slide to, um, do, uh, to double up as a shout out to the project team. And uh, anybody who was starred was an like, original um, project man, um, member that was named on a grant. But um, after, after the instructor training and after we started to kind of build out, we, we doubled. And um, I really wanted to um, like highlight the, the effort made. It's not a perfect uh, representation, but, but, but we, work, we worked really hard to, to make this uh, tr uh, uh, project tri-campus. Uh, make it a tri-campus collaboration we've made up with different members from different parts of the library system and the university community so some of the um i guess the 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 um the angles would be like we had central libraries and and, and non-central libraries uh, we had public service uh, uh members and people people who work, who work on the back end uh, we had people um, not just within the library community. Um, we had people from 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 the research office participate, which was actually a very key strategic um, connection. And um, we didn't have anybody from the U of T Coders Club um, be part of our team because um, um, it would have been like a volunteer kind of thing, and we didn't feel like we could ask them. But I also wanted to give them uh, give a shout out to the U of T Coders Club because um, they had a lot of experience organizing um, technical skills workshops because it was such a demand, and they were they were so committed to to doing this. They were doing this for free and had a lot of experience around organizing workshops and building um, building communities. So we worked closely with them. Um, and and learned a lot from them, and and the benefit of um, us um, uh, offering instructor training was that their new members then could become um, trained as 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 instructors, and it kind of um, re replenished a new generation of instructors for for that club. So that was kind of a neat mutual benefit that we saw from uh, from this project. Um, I just wanted to touch on some very broad, um, big picture lessons learned. Um, you know, this is the first time we did, ever did anything like this. Um, all of us are relatively new to um, the University of, of Toronto community. And so it was uh, quite, quite, a, quite an interesting experience learning to be open to the power of grassroots efforts and, um, and, and to be uh, learning to uh, very intentionally practice um, um, inclusion and diversity. Um, and, you know, we had to work hard at this is part of the labor that um, that 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 Jordan had mentioned earlier, um, you know, being open to talk to um, um, others and units different from ourselves, different floors, different buildings across campus, um, being open to transcend like, like siloed boundaries. Um, and then learning to move at the pace of trust as we built relationships out um, or built relationships with. And uh, the Carpentries was, you know, a really interesting way to inject e external DNA, external DNA, um, like the, the community of practice that's been formed in the Carpentries. It was a really neat way to kind of inject that into, um, into a system that is um, kind of can be, can be, can be easily silo eyes at times. Um, we had to learn how to accept help and when to centralize or decentralize um, um, work strategically. And uh, I already mentioned the, the, the key partnership um, that we formed with um, um, somebody from the Office of Research. Um, that could be in itself its own presentation. 
Um, and then, you know, and then, and then also while we are doing the work, but letting the good work and, and the outcome speak for itself. So um, um, that, that kind of carried the message and momentum forward. Um, but also we had to be deliberate and over communicating because in a large ecosystem like the one that Rachel had, had, had given an overview, you kind of just have to keep, keep, keep um, um, letting people know what's available. And um, yeah, I, I just one conclusion that I have thought it's not a like a like a like a, a final conclusion, but it's a working thought is is that uh, the library just is uniquely positioned to transcend silos and um, and because of the way it's positioned to do that, then I, I, I think it has a, a, a really core and strategic role to play in facilitating computational literacy and pedagogical literacy. Um, and the library in consultation with an office of research is, is a really natural facilitator for technical skill learning um, and also how to teach technical skill learning. Uh, the library has a kind of a unique bird's eye view because it supports everybody um, um, in the university community. Uh, we, we, do already, we already have a mindset of going to where our users are. We already have this mindset of, of equipping or um, um, empowering um, um, community library users with different kinds of literacy. And honestly, there's more demand for this type of learning than the library could possibly supply. So we, we thought, why not, just, why not just be part of something that gives it away? You know, of course, the library will always play a role in delivering workshops, technical skill workshops, but we, we can only deliver so much. So why not share out the opportunity for other people to teach and they can teach themselves. And um, yeah, I think that's kind of an interesting role that a, a library can play. In terms of logistical lessons learned throughout this journey, uh, if you have a larger community that you are servicing, aim for gold tier membership with the Carpentries because there is support, logistical support from the organization. Uh, alert supervisors of staff who have signed up for instructor training so that they can be part of supporting that certification process, as well as request ad additional budget lines if possible. And this is to go towards honorariums for non-university staff, such as students who might be teaching workshops or providing refreshments for coordinated workshops, supporting staff uh, for setup. Overall, we know with empowering collaboration, it takes a lot of resources. There's a lot of labor that is not readily visible. Okay, so for the next steps, we have a few different threads kind of going on. There's, of course, the ongoing um, maintenance work. So we're still continuing to use our listserv. We're promoting all the oppor teaching opportunities that we can. Um, and some of those, unfortunately, again, have been canceled by, by COVID. We had some instructors who were going to teach at the Health Librarianship Conference, the Canadian Health Librarianship Conference. Um, which was great because it was bringing together members of the library as well as some graduate students who had attended the training. So again, we're, we're trying to keep those supports in place so that those collaborations have a really easy place to be found. Um, we're also then another thread working on assessments. So looking at all of the um, surveys we've gathered as we've hosted workshops, all of the uh, testimonies from people going through instructor training, um, and really being able to make a case for uh, where does this belong? What are the outcomes of it? Um, what is the value? Because I think we all sometimes struggle with some of these less quantifiable uh, outcomes, just how important they are to our university. Um, and then the third thread is looking at the future sustainability of the project. So as we've been talking about, it does take a lot of resources and a large amount of labor that's not readily visible. So being able to um, trust in the community that everybody is going to want to participate, but also being able to, as a project team, be there to be supportive um, if anything's needed is often uh, very labor intensive, uh, even though it comes with some incredible results. So we're right now looking for a permanent home for this Carpentries at University of Toronto project can live. Uh, we've been talking to different committees and different research groups, um, and it's an, it's an ongoing search uh, that we haven't found an intuitive home for this to land, unfortunately. Um, but we're still, we're still working at it. 
Um, we're also looking at ways that we can encourage growth. So is there a way that we can make it sustainable that we have enough instructors? One possible way to do this would be to get some members in Southern Ontario or at the University of Toronto who were a certified instructor trainer. This is like a meta level trainer. Um, but those, uh, those trainers are accepted by application only. And there was a call that went out probably six months ago and nobody from the University of Toronto was accepted, which is totally fine. They're prioritizing other areas internationally and that's great. Um, but that might be one way for us to make this a little more sustainable locally as well, um, but is not, not currently in the works. And then lastly, for future sustainability, is it actually possible for us to encourage or facilitate enough teaching opportunities to meet the demands both of our students and researchers at the university, but also for all of the new instructors who are trained to actually have practice continuing to teach? And we found that a lot of people have also taken it upon themselves to do modified things. So teaching Excel workshops or teaching other technical tools where they're still taking this pedagogical approach um, back to their workforce or back to their, their campus or their home um, department, but it might not be carpentry specific and that's still a success, but can we keep facilitating these opportunities? So these are some things that we're thinking about um, and we'd be happy to answer questions about, but I'll turn it over to May for some concluding remarks. Yeah, so um, in the short time we, we've had together, uh, we've, we focused a lot on um, what we saw was the fruit of our labor. Um, but, you know, we, we've hinted here and there um, that creating an inclusive community of practice to learn and develop uh, computational thinking and skills um, uh, like with diversity in mind is, is actually quite challenging. Um, and having said that, uh, we, 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 we offer ourselves those resources for, for, for um, kind of, you know, um, um, kind of support. And um, and because we're very much still in a process of learning, this is this is a, a, a work in progress. Uh, we hope our, our presentation has given you some ideas to uh, think about uh, how to empower the communities you are part of uh, to develop and promote computational skills and access to technical um, tools um, needed to um, um, practice these skills. So um, yeah, I like to thank. Um, the organizers of the BCLA Summer Conference um, and um, um, Shan Shannon for um, getting us all set up. Uh, thank you all for making the time to hear our story and vision to democratize computational literacy and thinking. And I guess this might be a good time um, to um, take questions, um, to answer any questions you might have about our process. And I can actually read out some of the questions in the chat. Um, also for the reporting's sake. Um, so there was a question earlier that from Marilyn that said, as a novice tech person living in the West, how would one engage in technical workshops in the Vancouver area? And I just responded that I would send some links at the end of the presentation um, about the library carpentry specifically, but Rachel or May, would you have anything to add about maybe Code for Live or some of the other um, organizations that might have some resources for people who are new to technical skills? I, I'm going to assume you're going to probably send the software carpentry or the carpentry's website, but uh, on that website, there is a directory that lists by your location of where instructors are. So that would be a good place to start if you're looking at specifically the carpentry's community, uh, which I see has been posted in the chat, which is great. Uh, but I do believe they have that there. And there's also uh, additional, I believe there's a, a, not a Slack, but a Discord or a Gitter server. There's a mailing list. There's a bunch of resources on the website if you're specifically looking for carpentries in your area. Yeah. When, one suggestion that I have, um, you know, when I was living in, in BC and was seeking out the same types of things, I, I, there wasn't a whole lot readily available. So that was a huge motivation because I didn't get that job. Uh, that was a huge motivation for um, being part of organizing the, the training that you think is missing. And so um, I'm not sure what networks um, you are part of, Marilyn, um, but I was really involved with the BC CATS, which is the, um, the technical uh, cataloging and technical services interest group that's um, 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 under BCLA. 
and they've got a really um, robust um, professional development um, kind of um, 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 agenda, I guess, right? Like that's a very, um, people, pe people are, 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 it's a very open space for people to express what they want to learn. And so if there's, you know, enough critical mass um, to be able to form a workshop, to organize a workshop um, and, um, and, you know, pay for itself sort of thing, then um, like that's kind of how I made things happen. So if you're plugged into your um, professional association, that might be a great place to um, um, ask for this or be part of creating um, and some opportunities for yourself and, and, and other, other people. Um, I, I, another place could be uh, the public library. I, I think West Vancouver. Uh, so I see that Marilyn's from, well, she's living in the West. Okay, I thought it was New West, but living in the West. Um, I, I think West Vancouver uh, Memorial has a really active um, kind of digital skills program for their community. Um, I believe Sarah Falconar might be somebody to talk to about that. So, I mean, it kind of depends on kind of where you're coming at it from. Like, are you talking about wanting to skill up generally or um, as a person working in the library field uh, with a particular goal in mind? Um, so those are some um, top of mind thoughts that I, that I have. I think those are probably a good place to start, man. If you have any links that I've missed, if you want to throw them in the chat. And I'll bring up the second question that I've seen so far uh, in the chat window, which is from Sarah that says, thanks for the great presentation. I'm just wondering if you have seen any impact of the project on the library staff in terms of computational skills. Um, I have some thoughts on this, but May, would you like to go first? Uh, yes. Um, so uh, a couple of my uh, staff within my department, so I managed a, a cataloging department, uh, a couple, three actually, three people got into instructor training there. And what's been really interesting is um, seeing um, uh, staff there go out into the community and teach technical skills. So I think one of um, one of us actually is teaching at Ryerson or for uh, with uh, well they're affiliated with a provincial group that's that's um, um, that where the space originally was sponsored by Ryerson and and she's been involved with teaching workshops this month. But what's been really interesting is because of the pandemic and needing to work at home and all of a sudden we are not working with physical materials anymore and we're working off spreadsheets and working with batch data and whatnot the the the, pedag the, pedag the pedagogy um um that uh, of the instructor training is such where you could actually like teach anything technical not just the carpentry's curriculum but how to use spreadsheets how to scaffold learning if there's a particular methodology in, in coaching people to learn new technical skills so i'm actually very grateful that um a three of the librarians in my department were open to going through this process and um i was kind of joking earlier be, before the session started that the pandemic has kind of brought the future to here now and um and all of a sudden people had to kind of ramp up and learning new tools and so having um three people in my department uh, with that mindset on how to teach, um, I think like help to get um, some some staff settled into new workflows with and new tools more quickly um, and and not as stressful. It's still stressful, but I was just really glad that they they had that skill set to to uh, walk people through. Um, and something else I'd like to add is, like Rachel was mentioning, the carpentry is a sort of a three-pronged entity with data carpentry, software carpentry, and library carpentries. And we hosted a library carpentries workshop at one of our campuses in January. And so the lessons included things like introduction to working with data, so how to use some regular expressions, the Unix shell or how to interact with your computer in a command line, SQL and working with um, databases, as well as OpenRefine, which is for wrangling messy data, basically. And that workshop was something that I was really proud to be a part of because it brought together, um, I would say our workshop was probably one third librarians from, librarians or library staff from the University of Toronto Libraries. Another third was actually iSchool students, so people pursuing their Masters of Information. And then the other third was external um, people who wanted to join us. So this was 
uh, library technicians, library staff, or people working with information technology in um, other college libraries um, and various other organizations around uh, Southern Ontario. And it actually made for an excellent group. And I was so pleasantly surprised that we had such a wide variety of people. And I think for us, it was a moment where I got a lot of feedback from other students who were currently in the high school, seeing as I had just been a recent grad and they, they had asked, well, like this finally for me put into perspective the technical skills I'm not learning at university, but I know I'm going to need when I graduate. Um, and so I had had a similar experience, so it was very validating to hear other people having something similar. Um, but I think for me, it also really brought into focus how this project is helping our current staff, but also helping potentially the, the future of librarianship, as well as um, just other community stakeholders, because some of our graduate students come from medicine or a variety of faculties that they're going to go on and their professional lives are going to be richer because they were a part of this. And so it's been really rewarding. I think we both saw impacts on our current library staff, but also some of the library workers of the future. So yeah, I was very pleased with it. Um, and I don't actually see any other questions in the chat. Um, no problem, Sarah. <laughs> uh, if anybody has any more questions, you can feel free to reach out to May. Her email is here. You can also reach out to Rachel and I. Um, I think you can find us with a quick Google. We're fairly, fairly flexible. <laughs> um, but otherwise, do Rachel or May, do you have any other closing remarks? Thank you for attending. I hope uh, you know, our individual journeys uh, gave you some insight about how you, know, you could potentially bring carpentries to your community and uh, thinking about computational thinking. Yeah, and I don't have any um, last um, remarks apart from just repeating that we, I hope that, um, you know, even though we're, we're talking about a very defined uh, university community, we, we do hope that there are some things that um, we've shown that might be transferable in, in, in the networks and communities you're part of. So um, yeah, thank you for attending our session. Um, and uh, I'm gonna pass the time back over to Annette now. Great, uh, thank you, Jordan. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you, May, we do miss you in BC. It's been um, a pleasure to have all of you today. And really, we welcome this contribution to our collective learning. Um, being part of the summer conference, um, having you being part of the summer conference uh, means a lot to us in the library community and to BCLA as well. So to those of you that would like to watch the recorded version of this session, or perhaps to recommend it to someone else to watch, please visit the BCLA website, and that's www.bclaconnect.ca. And there you'll find information um, about the suite of virtual sessions that we've put together, and you'll be able to find this, this um, session recorded uh, and uh, on the website as well. So thank you all uh, for attending the BCLA Summer Conference Series titled, The, Con the Conversation Continues. Thanks all. Bye-bye.